Welcome to QCC's Face the Region. Face the Region is produced by Quinsigamond Community College to assist our region in attaining educational, economic, and personal prosperity. Good afternoon and welcome once again to Face the Region here on Full Service Radio AM 830 WCRN. I'm Zip Zipfell and uh, this afternoon spending some time with Anita Sirocco who is the department coordinator and also a professor of environmental science here at QCC. And a bit later on, we'll be chatting with uh, your assistant professor and also a uh, colleague, colleague uh, Professor Florence Munyari, who is also, again, a professor of environmental science, uh, talking about the liberal arts environmental science option here at QCC. And I would imagine, Anita, um, just to get started, that with the uh, recent news of both Hurricane Harvey and Hurricane Irma, that is generating probably some serious interest in these courses and related courses. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, another course that we have here is called Climate and Weather, and Professor Manuri teaches that, and I'm sure there's a lot of discussion happening with current events, with all the hurricanes going through, and definitely all the students, you know, they're aware because of all the media coverage, not only of that, but, you know, how does that tr tie into global, global climate change and, you know, all the different issues that are happening worldwide. Now, in the coverage of the hurricane, I kept kept hearing the anchors repeatedly speaking about the fact that um, uh, the ocean being so warm, especially in the Florida Straits, that that was feeding the energy of the mm -hmm. hurricanes. Is that directly relatable back to global warming? Because that was getting kicked around, too. It's been a political football forever, but... Yeah, and, you know, that's what really concerns me, is that it is a political football game, and reality is it's science. It's simple science. We know hurricanes are fueled by hot ocean temperatures. You need that minimum temperature of 80 degrees Fahrenheit to have a hurricane, and the longer that the hurricane is traveling and those hot ocean temperatures, the more fuel it gets, and therefore the more intense it's going to be. Where global climate change takes part in this is the fact that we are warming those ocean temperatures. And so there are parts of the ocean that are still 80 or above where they normally wouldn't be at a particular time of year or are have hit 80 degrees when they normally wouldn't be um, because of global climate change. And so what that's done is created the recipe for more intense storms. So I hear a lot, like you said, kicked around. One of the theories is that you know these hurricanes are present because of global climate change, and that's not true at all. Um, what is true is that these storms are more intense than they normally would be because of global climate change, because the fuel of a hurricane is that warm ocean temperature. So uh, the other thing I, I wanted to ask, and I heard two of my friends say this to me. Can't they just drop a bomb or, you know, seed the cloud? Or can't they get in there and change the course? I mean, is that something that can conceivably be on the table in the future? In the future, I'm sure there's a number of things that they can do in technology. And, you know, cloud seeding and controlling the weather, that's some stuff that people talk about all the time, just like, why don't we throw all of our trash into space? Um, we also have to think about some of the logics with this, like how much fossil fuels you use to get into space, for example. So, you know, is that... Is that what we should be doing, producing more and more trash so that we can throw it to Mars one day? Probably not. You know, it's, it's really important that we step back and try to look at what's something that we can all do immediately today to prevent these damages. Um, and that's making changes in our lifestyle to combat global climate change and reduce that impact because that's something we do have control over. We don't have to wait for technology or, you know, additional resources for. Um, and, you know, just these two hurricanes alone is over $2 billion in damage. And so for those political interests that try to always paint global climate change as something that's artificial or some sort of myth, you know, and claim that they're for the economy, you got to remember this type of natural disaster takes a huge economic toll um, for us. And by reducing our impact on global climate change, we can also save money because we won't be having to have as much hurricane relief and see people's lives decimated. Well, then again, I, and I can already hear the lobbyists for the major companies whose bread and butter, mm -hmm. you know, is directly affected by controls on emissions and whatnot, um, pushing back against that. Um, the students coming into your programs, are they interested in these types of discussions? And is it something that you, you, you cover in the course? Oh, absolutely. And you know, the students in the major, of course, are very interested in it. That's why they've chose yeah. to you know, pursue that for their life. But I get a lot of students that are non-majors in my environmental science courses. And the fact of the matter is, everybody's interested in having that discussion. Um, I 
have many students that hear that political football game, like you said, and they come here and they don't actually know what to believe. And so they want that education and they want that clarification. You know, what is global climate change and how does that play a direct role in these storms? Did it create them? Um, did it make it more intense or does it not have anything to do with it at all? And when I explain the science about the ocean temperatures and, you know, fueling it and making it more intense rather than creating them in the first place, things really start to click together. And, you know, everybody is curious, especially this new generation, because they're the ones who are at the forefront of these environmental problems. Well, I do know one thing, um, and it occurred to me, um, I actually own a piece of property and it happened to be in Naples, which ended up getting the mm -hmm. full force of the storm. But interestingly enough, um, during the, and not to get into the entire dissection of the whole process, um, but I was a little amazed in that they had a pretty good idea of where it was going to hit, but mm -hmm. um, there is fluctuation. Why is it such an imperfect science? Well, you know, meteorology can be imperfect. Climate models can be imperfect. Um, I guess the real question is, or I guess the real answer is, I mean, um, I say we've come a long way at being able to predict these um, these hurricanes and you to mean be old able to track Tom them. Is not yeah, exactly. So, on. you know, I think I think we do a pretty good job of figuring out how intense they are and where they're going to hit. But is it a perfect science? No. Right. Uh, so, so a student coming into your uh, in, into one of well, this program are there related uh, courses too um, to, to these classes? Oh, absolutely. So, you know, climate and weather, which is Science 104, um, which Florence teaches it, I teach it, and also another of our colleagues, Mark Duval, teaches it. Um, that focuses on you know hurricanes, tornadoes, and all weather phenomenon and the science behind them. So they talk about it there. Um, in my course, which is Science 110, which Florence and Mark also teach, um, we we talk more about global climate change and kind of what's the relationship between a lot of the phenomenon we see and human beings and our activities. Um, and like just one final thought here, and, and we'll talk to Florence in the next segment. Um, your own personal belief is global warming a real thing and is it something we need to be concerned about i know i should yeah <laughs> so global climate change is not santa claus i don't think there's such a thing as do you believe in it it's science and you know you it can't it's it's happening it's real the scientific community is is sure of that and you know we we can't choose to believe in or not believe in science science is science it's fact um, it's no longer up for debate there's enough data enough studies and enough consensus in the scientific community that global Global climate change is a fact. Human activities have contributed to it greatly, and it's a fact that if we don't change our behavior globally, all seven and a half billion of us, we're all going to be, you know, in in deep trouble here. Okay, so those who oppose your opinion on that or the, those facts, what grounds do they stand on? Is it? I mean, negating science. I I, I don't know. There's. I mean. Political do. grounds, right. um, well, special I mean, interests. Yeah. yeah, you know, there's you know, there's been people who've been denying science forever, and you know, a lot of the denial does come from special interests, people in the oil and gas industries, um, you know, coal miners and, and steel workers who think about it more as this is going to cause me to immediately lose my job and not be able to feed my family. Right, right. And I don't discount those struggles because those are real struggles. But the question is going forward, knowing that that's not you know, that's a non-renewable resource and not giving these people any job security. The question is, how can we train them into renewable resources? Because nobody should have to be left with that decision that I'm not going to be employed and I'm not going to be able to feed my family. But we can't afford to just pollute the environment um, and try to paint science as a myth to forward our agenda either. Well, we're very uh, lucky to have folks like you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> leading the charge uh, to, to hopefully make that happen. And I'm, I'm hopefully motivating my students to lead the charge because, you know, I have some really wonderful students um, in this major and they're passionate and they're they are ready to go. Well, Anita, thank you so much for being with us on this segment. Thank you for having me. And coming up in just a couple of minutes when Face the Region continues, we'll chat with Florence Mignari, who is also a professor of environmental science, and get her take on this, all these important issues when Face the Region continues here on Full Service Radio, AM 830 WCRN. <laughs> Welcome back once again to Face the Region uh, here on Full Service Radio, AM 830 WCRN. I'm Sip Sipfell, and joining me now for the next couple of segments is Florence Munyari. I hope I, did I get that right? Munyari. Munyari, uh, professor of environmental science here at QCC. 
Uh, we chat with Anita Sirocco, who is uh, her colleague and uh, in the same. Now, is, is the, it's the liberal arts environmental science option. Is that actually the courses you're involved with? Uh, we teach uh, courses that lead to that, yes. Oh, that's right. So yes. it's that, that's the option. Mm -hmm. um, in the first segment with Anita, we were uh, chatting about something which is really on the top of everybody's minds, and that mm -hmm. is, of course, uh, Hurricane, uh, most recently Hurricane Irma, and, and then, of course, the Harvey in Texas, which uh, they'll be cleaning up from that for, for months now uh, to come. Um, I was just curious, what are... Judging by what happened in Florida and what happened in Texas, we've had hurricanes here in the Northeast. Is it likely that we'll see uh, hurricanes continue to, to follow that course and affect the Northeast, or are they unpredictable? Well, yeah, as you say, they are unpredictable, but we think that uh, things seem to be changing. And uh, scientists agree that global warming could actually be causing some of these changes that we are seeing. So it may be that in the future we are going to have more stronger storms. And what was interesting about Alma is that it kept changing, you know. It was so hard to predict the actual path, uh, you know, that the, path, that the storm was taking. And so I think these are some of the challenges that we may be experiencing with global warming. Uh, and that's something that we, we talked a little bit about with mm -hmm. Anita. Mm -hmm. um, she is uh, pretty outspoken as uh, how she feels about the fact that uh, um, you know, special interests and some political types in Washington are, are, do not take global warming seriously, probably because of its economic impact on their various industries. And um, How do you feel personally? There's no question that it's happening. Yes, scientific data actually demonstrates that the Earth has been warming. And we have seen the trade in the amount of carbon dioxide that's being released into the atmosphere increasing more or less on a yearly basis. So scientifically, we know that global warming is actually happening. When uh, some of these people who oppose the opinion that it's global warming, uh, what, um, what scientific, are, are, is there any scientific footing they're standing on or are they just, is it more of a discussion, you know, as far as special interests and their own economic well-being? Wow, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question and, um, well, I think special interests could play a, a role here, but science, on the other hand, is showing that global warming is really uh, a real thing that's happening. So there could be other reasons why people see it differently, but in science we look at evidence, we look at um, data, and all things point uh, towards, you know, human activity, um, you know, affecting some of these things, whatever we are doing to the environment. Mm. Are we doing enough? Um is there enough research? Uh, are, are we taking the right steps to, uh, you know, turn this around? Um, or is there still not enough public outcry to, to uh, facilitate some of these changes? Well, I feel maybe we could do more. Uh, I believe a lot is being done, but there's always a chance that we could intensify our efforts to curb global warming. So yeah. I still feel there's a lot that could be done in the future. Now, are these the types of topics that um, you deal with with your students in your classes? Uh, um, oh, even yeah. From a political <laughs> bent, I mean, it's, it's part of it. Well, it's part of it, and, you know, it's sometimes interesting just to want to hear what students feel about the whole topic. So usually I give students an assignment. Uh, I usually like them to do a research paper for me when it comes to climate change because I want to see you know, how much they know, how much, you know, information they can gather about the topic. It's a very broad topic. There's so many controversial things, you know, about it. So I like giving my students a project to write sure. on climate change. You know, it, it seems, mm -hmm. um, at least from my viewpoint, that when you talk about, uh, say, having students research a topic for a paper, mm -hmm. um, back in the day, um, and I'm 
quite a bit older, but you know, we really pretty much just had the library and encyclopedias and, mm -hmm. and research papers and maybe scientific journals. But these days, I mean, it's so easy to kind of Google something or uh, Wikipedia or uh, read somebody's blog. Mm -hmm. Does that kind of, for lack of a better term, water down the scientific fact and, and inject more opinion than fact? Oh, that's a good question because one of the things we train our students to do is to judge, you know, evaluate scientific information, evaluate any source of information that, you know, they're getting confronted with. So we teach them, you know, how to evaluate whatever they come across in the web or wherever. And, you know, we tell them, you know, in science, we follow the scientific method and, you know, whatever is presented there, you have to ask several questions before you can take it as gospel truth. And so, you know, those are the efforts we make in trying to help them determine what can be relied on and what really may be questionable. So, in other words, um, and I can't remember, it's been such a long time since I was in school. Yeah. Um, it, empirical fact or whatever, I, I can't remember what the, the exact term was. Mm -hmm. so, so you impress upon them that just don't take mm -hmm. a, a Google search as sure. being gospel truth and that exactly. it could be opinion or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, thrown up there uh, by a special interest group who has mm -hmm. a particular, you know, has some interest in that a report showing, you know, and a favorable uh, outcome to them. Mm -hmm. uh, we're chatting with uh, Florence uh, Magnari. She is professor of environmental science here at uh, Quinn Sigamond Community College. And I'm going to take a quick break. When we return, we'll find out more about not only some of the courses that are offered here, uh, but some of uh, the great things they're working on, and perhaps a little bit about the laboratory experiments they do, and uh, most of all about uh, how important uh, of course this is and probably should be. I think personally maybe in local schools uh, at an early age might be a good thing. Uh, we'll find out. Stay with us here on Full Service Radio AM 830 WCRN. Face the Region will continue in a, mo in a moment. Welcome back to Face the Region here on Full Service Radio AM 830 WCRN. The Quinn Sigamond Community College program heard weekly uh, here on CRN and also uh, you get to see us uh, on local cable access around uh, Greater Worcester from week to week. This afternoon, chatting with uh, Florence Magnari. She's the professional professor of environmental science here at QCC, a part of the liberal arts environmental science option. Let me ask you real quick. Um, so this is a two-year program, correct? Yes. Um, and it prepares you for an eventual four-year degree at uh, uh, do you have articulations with other school uh, four-year schools, or is it a yeah, wide open? Yeah, uh, we we have made some articulation agreement with some colleges around, but I think we are still pursuing more. Right. All right. Yeah. And uh, for the uninitiated, um, can you define articulation agreement? What what does that mean to the to uh, the student? It means that once you graduate uh, with the degree here, an associate degree, you can transfer to a four-year college and the credits that you gain here will help you, you know, in acquiring Be a four-year degree, they are right. recognized, yes. Right. Um, so the, the students, and, and not necessarily young kids, I suppose there's non-traditional students too taking your courses these days. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the um, job opportunities uh, that these this the types of disciplines lead to uh, in, in, you know here and beyond well with a degree in environmental science you know you can work in many fields you could work uh, you know in the in the department you know the in the department of forestry or environmental protection you know the EPA uh, some people could even work in the industry. So there are so many. Um, you could pursue research if you want to go into graduate school and become a researcher in environmental science. And so there are many job openings. There are many fields uh, that you know this uh, training could lead you to. Right. And now, are they uh, necessarily hands-on in the field jobs, or is there? 
you know, environmental law comes to mind. Is that something that you could eventually yeah, yes. you know, find you could, your way into? Yeah, you could into? also fight, into, uh, fight yourself in that, you know, in that field, yes. So I think it's really broad. Uh, you know, there's a way of branching into various fields, you know, with the basics in environmental science. Sure, I think, mm -hmm. I think that's one of the things uh, here at QCC um, that the entire, um, all the departments and professors do so well is excel at kind of finding out what students are really interested in. It, mm -hmm. it seems to be that uh, when, uh, when at least youngsters, uh, youngsters, kids mm -hmm. come out of high school and into college and not really sure what they want to do, mm -hmm. they take a wide spectrum of courses and then they kind of find out you know, what they're really interested in and where their heart lies. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it, it must be pretty gratifying mm -hmm. um, to have kids so interested in, in environmental science. Um, oh, yeah. I, we mentioned this just before we took a break. Um, do they have this type of, uh, are, are there environmental science courses in high schools now or are they, is it something that they're thinking about teaching, or is it part of a science class? Well, I think it, they do part of it in the science classes, yeah. because I know they, I hear sometimes, I have a son in, uh, in elementary school, and he talks about, oh, they're talking about the weather, breezes, hurricanes. Yeah, we discuss a lot yeah. uh, on hurricanes and other things. So there is an aspect of environmental science that is actually taught in elementary school. Right, so yeah. um, sometimes the seed is sown mm -hmm. at that early age for, for mm -hmm. that type oh, of yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. So if, if um, a student decides to take, um, take your course, uh, what's the, what are some of the things they could expect to, to experience and learn for that matter, or hopefully learn? <laughs> <laughs> I know they learn with you. In but. my class, I um, currently am teaching a course that's called uh, Sustaining the Arts Environment. Um, this is a class where we talk about sustainability. Yeah. All right, so how can we manage our resources in a way that we benefit ourselves and pass them on to the next generation without depleting them? So, you know, we talk about, you know, some of the things that we could change. How could we change our lifestyle to make the use of resources more sustainable? So in my class, I usually give students a project, uh, you know, to find out how we could make QCC, our campus, more green. Right. So that, that's usually one of the projects that students do for me and, you know, they look at all the aspects of the college, the way we, you know, we do things, the way we use resources, the way we use power, everything. And is there any way we could make an improvement? So that's always the question. And it's a whole semester course, I mean, project, so they have enough time to move around, ask questions, research, look for information. Mm -hmm. And I think that opens them up to, you know, the real issues that we are facing uh, globally when it comes to the use of resources, you know. Uh, it's, it's just by the end of the semester, I, I always get students say, oh, oh, this was tough, but it was a learning experience. That's I didn't know great. this and this happened. And, you know, they will go and find out information even from other colleges. This college is doing this. They're trying to do composting. This college is trying to, you know, to do this and that, you know, and so they come up with very interesting ideas and they, the final question is, Professor, uh, when is this going to be implemented? You know, so like, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm always left with that challenge, but I, you know, it's usually a very great learning experience for the students, just you know, to be faced with the real state of the world, the way things are. Yeah, and, and making a difference, stepping up and everybody kind of contributing that mm -hmm. one small footprint to, to make many. Oh, um, yeah. You know, it's interesting. Sustainability has become, you know, a word that when I was younger, I mean, I, don't, I know it existed, but I didn't hear it very often, you know, mm -hmm. and it was kind of back in the day, you turn the water tap on, it's there, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there was, well, we had the gas crisis there, but I think that was artificially created. But um, uh, but over the years, especially now, as the population continues to grow, I'm sure the numbers would show that uh, if we don't start, 
getting a, a, a grip on, on, you know, making sure we can have our, those critical things last. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's really super important. Well, that's great. So if a student was interested in uh, taking some of your courses, what should they visit the QCC website or what would be a good resource for them to see if they might be interested in following up? And oh yeah, they, they could uh, visit the QCC website and also they could, you know, contact me. I'm always... Directly? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm free to <laughs> talk with them if, if, if they so wish. Accessibility, sustainability, that's what it's all about. Oh yeah, so... We should feel free to look for more information uh, at QCC, you know, our website, and also feel free to talk with the professors here. Yeah. Yes. That's another great thing. That's yeah. all I oh, the professors are so helpful, and I still mm -hmm. stay in touch with my professor. I've graduated, but it's great, you know. Mm -hmm. That's good stuff. You're doing a great job, mm -hmm. as, uh, as do all the, uh, all the professors here and adjunct professors as well at QCC. Uh, Florence, want to thank you for coming by. We'll visit again at some thank point, you. I'm sure. I Keep appreciate up the good thank work. You. Keep the people thinking about sustainability. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, uh, next week at the same time, we'll be visiting with another aspect and another professor of one of the courses here at QCC on Face the Region, heard right here on Full Service Radio, AMA 30 WCRN. Have a great week. This has been Quinsigamond Community College's Face the Region. Join us again next weekend on AM 830 WCRN.